first invention, often called his greatest, was the wheel. It made the horizon attainable. Through the ages, man went rolling ahead into the future. Then, some hundred years ago, a new horizon shone and the great surge of a mighty nation went wheeling westward by wagon and horse and hope. a future they thought only their own, never dreaming that in the century to come, their names would be listed high among the makers of America. Their first job was shoeing a horse. Their fee, 25 cents. Our first customer, Henry. Clem, we're in business. You won't be in business long. You leave your tools in the ground. just had our first customer, and he liked the job. Well, I taught you your trade the best I knew. Now you're striking out on your own. That can be a good thing. It's up to you. I, uh, I brought this with me because, well, because this is where it belongs. I've had my own shop, and I've worked for others. And if I've ever learned anything in life, it's this. It's yours now. Shoeing horses, repairing wagons, and then building wagons. Their brother Peter proved his salesmanship when he got an order from the army for 100 wagons. And with this order, they faced a crisis. Where were they to get the money for materials and labor? The problem was solved by the timely arrival of another brother, John Moeller Studebaker, who had just returned from California. I've got the money. Here's $8,000. Henry gladly sold his share of the business to John in order to buy the farm he had longed for. Uh, uh, Clem and I drew up sort of an agreement before we had any notion you'd be buying in, J.M. You see, we... J.M.? Well, why not? It's, uh, it's more business-like than John Moeller. <laughs> J.M. Yeah, I like that. Here it is. Peter Studebaker agree to sell all the wagons my brother Clem can make. Signed, Peter Studebaker. I, Clem Studebaker, agree to make all the wagons my brother Peter can sell. Signed, Clem Studebaker. Well, that's certainly businesslike. Business. Well, we're in one now. A big one. The nation was growing. And the Studebaker company expanded with it. Now joined by their brother Jacob, the brothers saw sales pass the million-dollar mark in 1874. This year also witnessed the catastrophic fire that destroyed two-thirds of the Studebaker plant. J.M., we can't blame this tragedy on ourselves. Maybe not. We can shut down, the plant at least. Yeah. But what about our men? Most of them have never worked for anyone but us. They helped us to build a tradition of fine craftsmanship. We had sons working at benches beside their fathers, learning the right way to make wagons and carriages, taking pride in their work. They just had to stay in business. They would raise money from the Chicago bank and rebuild. And you can tell them in Chicago that we're going to build better than before and bigger. plant in the world. A plant to keep pace with an America making gigantic strides in science and industry. 25 years later, progress was keyed by a younger generation, such as J.M.'s son-in-law, Frederick S. Fish. Four of the brothers had passed on, leaving only J.M. The 
gratifying record of achievement and a keen enthusiasm for the newest form of transportation, the automobile. The new and complicated mechanical needs of this day were a far cry from the first simplicity of the buggy days. get over enthusiastic here. This is just the beginning. Then you do think we're ready? Mm -hmm. It's been worth the seven years of development. I think the time has come for us to go into the manufacture of gasoline automobiles. Take me back to the plant. We've got some figuring to do. Yes, sir. That was the beginning. The wave of enthusiasm for the new gasoline buggy mounted tremendously till World War I. When Studebaker, under the leadership of A.R. Erskine, was one of the first to convert to military production. With the coming of peace, manufacture began on a completely new Big Six. Its instantaneous public acceptance so securely established the company in automobiles that the manufacture of wagons was reluctantly abandoned. Studebaker alone, among 5,000 wagon makers, accomplished the transition from horse-drawn to motor-powered vehicles. This unbroken advance was endangered by the crash of 1929 and the ensuing depression. Then with Paul G. Hoffman in charge of sales and Harold S. Vance in charge of production, the company emerged from the threat of disaster intact without loss of identity or sacrifice of its founder's principles. In 1939, Studebaker entered the low-priced field with the high-quality car, the Champion. With the Champion an instant success, Studebaker resumed leadership in the progress of transportation. World War II, and the company suspended the production of civilian cars and dedicated its assembly lines to the armament program. Trucks. Light-track vehicles heavy bomber airplane motors. Conversion to peacetime production brought an even better champion, a car of revolutionary new design for the post-war world. Today, Studebaker's newest models continue to justify its eminence in the forefront of American progress. Mr. Vance, I don't think a better car can be built. The new one is the absolute ultimate in design, in craftsmanship, in quality. The ultimate for now. Studebaker built each one of these to serve long and well. And each one of these was the best for its time. We've made progress during the years that have passed. And the years to come will bring radical new developments in transportation, involving new problems, New challenges, new opportunities. The story of this company is very much like the story of America. Always pushing forward a new frontier. Our past is romantic and full of achievement. But there is a future more challenging than the past. This company has seen many changes. But there's one thing that hasn't changed. The basic quality has provided the inspiration for Studebaker's first 100 years of progress. <laughs>